And Nash, the trouble with that argument is that you basically contradict yourself. Um, you say, you use the word created, which is in, a, in effect a word from the novel, <laughs> and you claim to give it meaning. Well, if it doesn't mean what it means in the novel, then we don't know what it means. And so your ins assist insistence that, well, look, if it has a beginning, something has to create it. That's, you're, you're helping yourself to the regularities within the world, of, uh, within the natural world, and then you're saying, oh, but they don't apply outside the, the, the natural world. Well, if they don't apply outside the natural world, then you have no right to talk about, about um, creation at all, because that's something that we know of from the natural world. <clears throat> Forgive me if I don't articulate this very clearly, but um, as far as I understand it, Pascal's wager uh, is basically you're, you're betting on uh, if you don't believe in God, then you know you might be screwing yourself over in the afterlife because then you'll be divided from Him. And uh, the thing I take issue with, or that I find kind of makes the whole argument fallacious, is uh, it doesn't allow for the possibility that a non-believer could, um, in fact, be intimate with the divine in the afterlife. It, it assumes the kind of Abrahamic premise that um, disbelief is, a, is in some fashion offensive to the divine and therefore divides you from him or it in the afterlife. And, and basically what I'm saying is um, if we then say, okay, it is possible that a non-believer could, could find intimacy with the, with the divine in the afterlife, then Pascal's wager is, is uh, reduced to, well, it's still a really good bet because a lot of people believe in these kind of Judeo-Christian idea of reward and punishment based on faith. But then where do you draw the line? Because then I could, I could come up with a rule today that said I, I feel really strongly that if you don't, do 10 push-ups a day, you're going to hell. And it's a, it's a good bet because if you go ahead and do the 10 push-ups, then you're all set. But if you don't do them, you're risking going to hell. So I'm just saying, where do you draw the line in terms of abs absurdity? I mean, is it, is, it, is it a more valid risk because so many people believe in this reward-punishment scheme? Well, um, I think the power of Pascal's wager is the following, and that is that it, uh, well, two things. One is it exposes the uh, great weakness of the agnostic position. Because the agnostic usually fashions himself or herself a morally superior person who, who stays in this sort of suspended doubt awaiting evidence. And what Pascal is saying is that, listen, no, um, this is not a reasonable position, not only, by the way, because of the afterlife, but because the afterlife makes a lot of difference in how you live now. I mean, imagine if someone were to say to you, instead of living for 80 years, you're going to live for 500 years. You probably would live somewhat differently. Or like the, like the recent movie uh, with Queen Latifah, where you, now, you know you have only seven more days to live. You would live differently. We would all live differently if we believed in eternal life. So the point that Pascal is making is, you have to take the idea seriously, not just for then, but also for now. It's going to affect how you live now. Okay? So agnosticism becomes, agnosticism becomes a sort of willful refusal to take a stance when it makes a lot of difference what you decide. See, one of the problems with saying, I'll only stick with scientific issues and only go with the scientific evidence, is that science, while sovereign in its own sphere, doesn't affect large spheres of life, including love, including consciousness, including will. I'm not saying science has nothing to say about it, but just read Steven, Steven Pinker's How the Mind Works. Science hasn't gotten very far in explaining sentience, morality. Not that the evolutionists haven't tried. They've tried really hard. And I'll say a word later maybe about evolution and morality. But what Pascal is basically saying is, in much of life, many of the decisions you make, you graduate from Tufts, you have a choice, do I become a poet or I go to law school? That choice may affect everything that subsequently happens to you. It may affect who you marry, where you go to graduate school, or whether you go at all, whether you end up in politics or a partner in a law firm. And you have no information. You can never get full information, and yet you have to choose. And the same is true of God as well. That's the argument.
Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for, for reading this, but I tried to put this all together, and I, it's too bizarre to, to remember. So I believe uh, this is for, uh, for Dr. D'Souza. I believe you, you, think, you call yourself a Christian. And um, so for the sake of argument, uh, let's accept your argument that there is a creator of the universe and that creator is omniscient. Um, what would make you go from that to um, that he's like also a loving God and he created us in his perfect image, but then we turned out to be imperfect, so he decided to cast us down to burn hell, but then he didn't feel so good about that, so the only loophole he could come up with, the creator of the universe, was to immaculately conceive a human child and have him tortured and killed and we're still imperfect, but that's okay if we suck up to him and the child and he doesn't want us to be gay and so on. Okay, I'll, let me try to answer in, in, kind of in the spirit. Um, <laughs> and that's this. Look, um, if you are trying to understand a phenomenon, whether you agree with it or not, you begin by understanding it by trying to understand it as the believer or the practitioner understands it themselves. If I was trying to understand uh, Dostoevsky or take uh, Hamlet, I wouldn't go, well, this is absolutely ridiculous. Witches appearing and so on. It's absurd. I'd throw the novel down right away. I'm not going to read it. It's absurd. No, I imagine, I suspend my disbelief. I say, let me try to experience Hamlet in the way Shakespeare wanted it experienced. And then once I've finished, once I've evaluated critically, I can step back and go, well, that didn't make much sense, and that didn't really follow from that, and why is Hamlet so indecisive, and so on. Okay, here's what I want to get at. Let me give you, if I may, in one minute, the Christian uh, reformulation of your statement of the human problem. The Christian formulation is this, and that is, quite apart from religion, we have a human problem. Namely, we live at two levels. We live here, and we want to be here. In other words, we, we, we want to be good, but we realize we fall short. We want to experience the divine, but God is invisible. He's not real to us on a daily basis. We feel the awful silence, you may say, speak from, from outside. So here we are as, as human beings, we're at this level. We want to ultimately experience the sublime. True? I think all human beings are that way. You, and that's why we have not just religion, we have art, we have literature, uh, we have love, ways of experiencing the sublime. Now, the different religions of the world all diagnose the human problem that way. And I see the Eastern religions as having one solution. The problem is the self, get rid of the self. I see the Judaism and Islam as having a common solution, which is basically, let's establish a set of rules and codes to bridge the gap between, you may say, man down here and God up here. And this involves dietary regulations and sacrifices and commandments and so on. And Christianity comes along and gives a totally different answer to that question, namely, look, the, the distance between the humans and the divine is so large that no matter how tall a ladder you build, you're not going to get there. Basically, the only way for man to reach God is for God to come down to man's level. And I'm stating this in, a, in very secular terms. So the incarnation is seen not as just some bloody sacrifice. I mean, most Christians would emphasize not the crucifixion, but the resurrection. The idea here is that in the ancient world, you had a lot of blood. Look at all the blood the Aztecs spilled. Look at, look at all the blood sacrifices in the ancient world. Basically, Christianity comes along, and the basic argument is God sacrifices his son, and that's the end of all the blood sacrifice. No more need to kill goats. No more need to take people and slap them on the altars and, and chop their heads off. And this was widespread in the ancient world in pagan cultures. And, 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 and these blood sacrifices, I would argue, have been revived in modern paganism and modern atheism. This idea that blood itself, blood itself is a source of power. Just read the rhetoric of the Nazis. There's a lot of talk about blood. Volk, blood, this idea of purifying blood is a, a revival of ancient animism and I would argue ancient paganism but given a secular guise I mean Hitler for example spent a lot of time to talking about the Nordic legends a lot of time talking about the ancient gods the only difference was he didn't believe in them he was trying to give them a secular reinterpretation